All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon Kreitz. I use he, him, his pronouns. DI webinar today. Um, first, I want to preface this by saying we had a little bit of some technological errors when we recorded it the first time during the live stream. So if you see a, a cut uh, here, then I wanted to let you know about that so you weren't confused. But thank you for your understanding. Um, but more importantly, I want to welcome you all to, uh, to another one of our webinar Wednesdays. Um, Today, we have the Center for, uh, Sir, uh, for Student Diversity and Inclusion, and uh, we're, I, we're surrounded by some, uh, virtually surrounded by some excellent people and staff members today that um, we'll introduce you to in a second. But I want to let you know that um, uh, if you are interested in learning more, um, there will be some contact information provided at the end of this webinar. Don't forget that you can always reach out to your enrollment manager if you have any other questions about your admission, financial aid, or enrollment status. Um, but if you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, please don't hesitate to type your questions into the chat box. Feel free to use your preferred pronouns if you'd like as well, um, as we want to be mindful of that. But without any further ado, I want to uh, take a moment to introduce Dr. Uh, Tiffany Green. Um, Dr. Tiffany Green comes to us from her most recent role as Assistant Provost for in, uh, Inclusive Excellence at Vanderbilt University. However, her passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion began earlier than this. Uh, she learned about the value of giving attention to equity and inclusion matters from her own personal experiences growing up in Detroit, Michigan. Later, as a student at the University of Michigan and Northwestern University, she was able to work in many mentor and, and peer capacities for programs targeting the recruitment and retention of students and faculty of color. She accomplished these projects in her roles as a graduate student and then later as a faculty member. In addition, she has a fundamental understanding of the importance of creating an inclusive and engaging work environment, having been a CEO. In that role, she worked hard to lead individuals across all walks and intersections of life. So thank you for being with us, Dr. Dr. Green. Thank you, um, and thank you for a wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is um, Tiffany Galvin Green. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'll just say a few things of, about what my new role is. So I'm actually in an inaugural role as the vice president or the first vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at John Carroll. And with that role um, comes a newly created division of diversity, equity, and inclusion that centralizes um, the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, Student Accessibility Services, as well as um, Title IX, our Title IX offices. So my main focus is on the implementation of the University Strategic Plan of Inclusive Excellence, which focuses on four, four broad areas um, in terms of campus-wide goals, um, that being one, improving institu institutional structures, policies, and practices with equity and inclusion in mind. Two, advancing educational and training opportunities. Um, three, diversifying in terms of our recruitment, hiring, and retention, both um, student at the student level as well as faculty and staff. And finally, four, just generally in enhancing campus climate to be as inclusive as possible. Um, for me personally, that means that my role is to ensure that every community member on campus can benefit from all that John Carroll University has to offer without any barriers and that, that everyone has an equitable opportunity for success. So my focus and attention spans across um, university departments and divisions and it incorporates students, staff, faculty, alumni, as well as local and national community partners. It's a multifaceted role, but I want you to know that um, I truly see myself as a resource and I um, see myself as a bridge or a connector between student needs, concerns, or even new ideas you may have. And that, that connection between you and senior administration and what we need to do institutionally. So not only am I involved um, with students through my um, division and work with student accessibility services as well as CSDI, um, those being more student facing support systems, I'm also open and available for direct contact as needed. So you can always reach out to me directly. The easiest way is diversity at jcu.edu. So I'm gonna turn things over now to um, my C CSDI team, which is um, Sada Ledesno, the director of CSDI, and Dr. Aaron Green, our Postmasters Diversity Fellow. Um, Salo's worked with John Carroll since 2011 in various roles before becoming the director in 2016. 
and he does various, so many different things in supporting um, comprehensive student programming, developing and improving services um, to increase diversity on campus overall. And he works, as well as he works one-on-one -on -one and mentors um, students and student cultural, um, the cultural student organizations. And Dr. Green began working at JCU in 2018 as the Postmaster's Diversity Fellow and she does a tremendous amount of work with um, not only does she teach in certain capacities but she does a tremendous a lot of work engaging first-year students in the MELT program which you'll hear more about and assisting and advising student organizations. She's actually become a fundamental um, leader and proponent for um, students of color, women, st women students of color in particular. So um, I'll let them further introduce themselves in the entire CSDI division, mission and activities, and what's important for you to know as prospective students. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green and Brandon for introducing me. My name is Solomon Rodesno, and on campus I'm known as Salo. I'm director of the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion. And I'm very happy that you've all chosen to take some time this afternoon to learn a little bit about the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion. On campus, we're known as CSDI. Um, I started working at the university in 2011 and I'm director of the office. My responsibility is to make sure that I provide supervision of all of the professional staff and also uh, advise our student organizations and our student staff. And today's presentation is all about you learning an overview of what we do as a department. And uh, we first want to uh, talk a little bit about who we are. So if you could have the next slide, please. Uh, our department is a center. And so I distinguish that from an office. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the distinguishing factors of an office that does transactional work and a center that does transformational work. We're located above the university bookstore and our hours are 8.30 uh, to about 6.30 every Monday through Friday. Our programming though happens um, beyond those hours, um, but most of the time folks are hanging out in our living room. Um, we will welcome you with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And usually there's very uh, various students, whether they are employed by us or hanging out, who come and frequent our office. And you'll learn about the different opportunities that uh, we have for students who are seeking employment. Um, but we don't do, I don't do the work with CSDI alone. I work as part of a team. So if you could have the next slide. My team is made up of a variety of professional staff, graduate student staff, and undergraduate student staff. Um, at the top, you see that I'm director and so I supervise everyone. Um, and then everyone below me has different areas of supervision, whether it be supervision of the student um, graduate students or the student interns. Uh, so I work very closely with uh, my administrative assistant, Silen Zarelli. Uh, I also work very closely with someone who I'd love for you to meet. Um, her name is Dr. Erin Green, and I'll let her introduce herself right now. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Erin Green. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am the Diversity Fellow in the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, primarily overseeing our MELT mentoring program, which you'll hear about briefly. Um, as well as working closely with one of our graduate assistants and our interns um, to help run MELT and conducting one-on-one -on -one advising as well as our general um, diversity and inclusion program on campus. So uh, every year CSDF employs about 35 to 40 students and there's different types of opportunities. Um, who is most visible is our graduate assistants. Uh, both Angela and Jamila are responsible for different areas. These are paraprofessionals. Um, they have real responsibilities by carrying out the mission and vision of CSDI, and you'll learn about that in just a couple of minutes. But we're gonna talk about um, some opportunities for you all as you are looking at your financial aid packages. Some of you might have something known as a um, work study award. So that's money that's been granted to you, but you have to work for it. And so we have different opportunities for you to consider uh, at working for our department. So Dr. Green will now talk about student staff opportunities and internship opportunities. Yes, so our student staff opportunities are opportunities for you to work within the office and help us with our day-to-day with our -day, uh, maintenance. So greeting folks as they come in, 
um, answering telephones, helping us with different projects, creating creative projects and interesting things to do around the office to um, increase our camaraderie and engagement with one another. All of those things are things that our office associates do. And so that helps them to build hard skills that they can put on their resume, as well as being able to make some extra money on campus. Um, it really puts them in a position to meet lots of folks, lots of students, lots of staff. And from those opportunities, um, they're even more engaged than your average student who does not work on campus. Generally, wherever you go, working on campus is a really good thing because it gets you engaged early and you're kind of in the loop of what's going on. You're the first to know about opportunities um, and you really get to take a full advantage of the experiences that the university has to offer. So our, our office associates um, really are important and integral to us because we're a small office and so they help us to run the office um, even when we're gone in meetings or after we've left for the workday. We also have um, event associates. And so those are students who don't necessarily have it within their schedule to work full shifts within our office, but they're also available for our major events. So they'll help us with our registration tables, help us to set up events, um, to greet visitors, et cetera. And so that's also another paid opportunity. The highest level of engagement in our office is internships. And so these are really important because one, not only do they give a stipend, but they also allow you to work in the office for anywhere between zero to three credits. And so that means that not only are you again working and getting those hard skills, but you're also able to get credit that goes on your transcript um, and to be able to kind of craft that experience yourself. So you'll see we have two interns. One is Serene, the other is Nadia. Serene is the intern for the MELT mentoring program, and so she helps us with sending out communications. Um, she helps us with recruitment and hiring and coming up with creative ideas to keep our MELT mentors and mentees engaged. And then we also have Nadia. Nadia is our social media and marketing intern, and so she helps us with the branding and the engagement of our office on our social media platform. So she knows how to look up insights. She creates engagement opportunities and polls and um, campaigns, um, highlighting our student accomplishments, our office events. And so because she has that knowledge set, because communication is her major, she's able to really help advance our office as well as benefiting from the professional development opportunities we give her. So I strongly encourage internships, be it with our office or otherwise, because they help you not only learn, um, they also usually provide some type of uh, reward or financial award, and um, they really help you get engaged early. Thank you, Dr. Green. At this point, many of you might be wondering, so what is the, um, the mission and the vision of our, uh, of our department? And every campus department has a reason that they exist on campus, and so We'd like to now talk about that and also give you a snapshot of what it looks like uh, year in and year out. So if you could have the next slide, please. I want at this point talk a little bit about our mission and our vision. I think about our mission is how we do our work day to day. And our vision, I think of that as like a, guardi a guiding like star. This is where we want to go. And so our mission is to develop programs to educate the entire campus community on issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And we provide that, and when we do that by providing services and support for students, but particularly by providing um, support to students from historically underrepresented backgrounds. And what do we mean by that? So we mean uh, students of color, students who identify as LGBTQ+, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, intersex or queer or questioning, and their allies, students who are first in their families to go to college, and students uh, with different um, disabilities. So these are the programs that we aim um, our programming and support services towards. Uh, but we also educate the entire campus on all these issues because we at John Carroll believe that this is a skill set that is critical for you all to be employable. And also just to be better citizens of, uh, of the world, being able to know and acknowledge and appreciate difference is important. That's why we do our mission and how we do our mission. Our vision, so where we want to go, is we want to nurture a sense of belonging for students from diverse backgrounds and encourage them to participate actively in their curricular and curricular experiences. So this is inside the classroom and outside the classroom. We want you to take that learning 
and implement it within your different disciplines. So it's not just staying in this little box of this is my diversity work. No, it should be extended across everything that you do, whether you're a business student, um, an accounting student, a student in art history, a student in um, political science, diversity and inclusion will be included in all of this. So our responsibility is to make you aware, knowledgeable, and have the skill set. That's our job. So what does this look like year to year? Dr. Green will talk a little bit about our statistics of um, what we've collected in the last year. Yes, so we come in contact with a lot of people, which is great, um, particularly because we're such a small office. So if we look at the statistics from our academic year 2018 to 2019, we had a little bit over 1,000 visits to our actual CSBI office. So we have two locations. Um, our actual office is located in the student center above the bookstore, but we also have a student lounge that is open 24 hours that is located on the lower level of the student center. Um, and so we've had about a thousand visits to our office. 243 of those visits are unique visitors, meaning that 243 different people came to our office. Um, and on average, people came about five times. So that shows you that not only are a lot of people coming in, but they're returning. And that's a good thing. And those visitors include not just students, but faculty, staff, community members, et cetera. Um, we also had 22 peer mentors in the 2018-19 school year who conducted 418 hours of mentoring to 37 first-year students. So again, our program is about matching incoming first-year students with upperclassmen. Last year, we uh, last year, we had 22 mentors. This year, we had about 30. And that number fluctuates depending on how many uh, first year students we need to accommodate who need that support. Um, we also had those peer mentors who helped with hosting or being involved in about 15 social programs. So not only as a mentor is it your job to check on your first year mentee or mentees, it's also your job to create social programming and spaces um, so that those students can get more engaged and so that you can engage with your fellow classmates. Um, we also had six academic internships. So I talked about what our internships look like. Of those six uh, interns, they conducted 810 hours of work for anywhere between one and three credits. So um, when students sign up to be an intern in our office, a lot of times they work with the Career Center and with the Career Center, they determine how many hours it is that they want to uh, take the internship for, which turns into actual work hours. So we sit down with that student, we create a schedule, um, they have routine meetings with us, they might work in the office or at a program, but they also might do things at home remotely. So uh, we had six interns do that. We've also had 160 unique programs. So this means that throughout the semester, we have hosted programs that have to do with either um, bringing in campus speakers, student organizations, uh, our signature programs, since like our MLK Day, et cetera. Um, of those 160 unique programs, we've had five, about 5,000 participants um, for that year. Um, our programming numbers probably will be a little shorter now because of the situation that we're in, but we've even now still been able to transition to doing some virtual programming um, and initiatives, events, and engagements with students that way. Um, oh, can we go back to more slides, Brandon? Uh, what, two more? The um, other statistics that I can share with you are that we have uh, about 13 student organizations now. So our cultural student organizations are groups of um, students who rally around a certain affinity. Um, they may or may not hold that identity themselves, but it is something that they're interested in. So examples of those groups, and Salo might have to help me because it's hard okay, to remember cool. 13. <laughs> okay, um, but we okay. have Black, <laughs> Black Students in Action. We have Halal, which is our Jewish Student Association. We have Women in STEM. We have French clubs. We have Italian clubs. We have LGBTQIA allies. Um, we have a Muslim Student Association, a Middle Eastern Student Association, a Minority Association of Prof 
pre-med students. And where are we at? We're at nine? Oh, we're nine. Hmm. We did we say Middle Eastern Student Association? I did say that. How about our um, MSS, Muslim Student Association? Our Muslim student, LASA. We have a Latin American, Latin American Student, student Association. Association. And then um, our... Um, we're forgetting somebody. Oh, gosh. Oh, my God. We can't remember the other two. But there's so many organizations. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> and the one thing I want you all to know is that John Carroll has about 100 plus student organizations. So these are just a snapshot of what we, um, the student organizations that work directly with us. And mm -hmm. Dr. Green provides direct advising and so do our graduate assistants. And the um, student organizations also provide their own programming. And so last year, um, student, uh, the student organizations created about 80, well, 24 community development activities. So those are the small ones. Um, and then large scale programs, they developed 66. So when you put those two together, our students are doing a lot of program and event planning. These are skills that are so important um, as you move on to John Carroll as a student leader, because a lot of our students become those student leaders that folks who are first years look up to and then they become. Yes, and also the um, work that the, our student organizations do is really important because again, we're a very small office and so it's really our student org that help to educate the campus community about these different topics of diversity. Um, again, those who make up these groups are not, you'll find people of all backgrounds involved in all of these groups. And uh, they also collaborate with one another quite a bit. So we've had events, um, well, one event that we're still hoping to have that we were hoping to do this semester was our Black Students in Action. We're going to team up with our Muslim Student Association in order to do a viewing of the movie Ali, right? That's a, collab that's a bridge that they share with one another and um, have conversations around what it might mean to be Muslim, to be Black, um, and the, the overlap in that, right? So those type of programs happen often, and they're really the key to how we help educate um, so many people with such a small office. Um, the last thing that I'll, the last stat that I'll give you is that we had a little over 5,000 individuals visit our CSBI lounge. And so that lounge, again, is open 24 hours for students. Um, that is a space that has couches. It has a um, lending library where you could simply take a book or leave a book. You don't have to tell us that you took it. You don't have to bring it back if you don't want to. Um, it has a TV. It has a chalkboard and a whiteboard. Um, and in that space, students are able to study any time of day that they want. They uh, hold their organization meetings there. We also allow people to reserve the space to a limited degree because we want to reserve it for students. Um, but we hold community meetings in there. Um, and it's just another space for students to go. It's tucked away, which is really cool um, because a lot of people don't know that it's back there, but it's very useful because um, students who need somewhere else to go, you'll learn that when you get to campus, you can't always study in your room. Um, you'll get tired of going to the library or to the same spots all the time. And that CSBI lounge is there for you. And our numbers show that people use it regularly. Mm -hmm. And for the students who will be uh, commuting, it's a space, a safe space to be in. It's open 24 hours so if, you, if you need to stay on campus a little later. Uh, you don't have to worry about being kicked out of um, any space. That is your space. And it's also shared space. We also will be unveiling our new Black Cultural Center, um, which is going to be in the same building as the Student Center. So we're excited about that. That will be another 24-hour um, access space. Um, uh, the commuters also have a commuter lounge. So all of those are spaces that are just for you all to use. And so um, I'm going to continue with the slide that we have here, our core values in action. Um, and so I'll let you all just read these on, on your own. But um, our values need to be practiced. And we do that by listening to student stories. And as you hear us and give examples of what we do, at the center of everything is students. Um, that's why we're very different from an office. The purpose of a student center is to provide transformational experiences. And how I compare that to is an ATM. An ATM provides a transaction. So you go into an ATM, you insert your debit card, and you know, beep, beep, boop, you type in your, uh, your code, and it gives you money. 
It's not going to ask you, how are you? It's not going to ask you uh, what you need beyond money. Uh, what's different, that's a transaction. A transformational experience is being able to ask you all the questions to understand you and your unique needs. And then implement those programs to address the needs that may be lacking or the things that you're interested in learning. And so that means that we advocate on a range of issues. We also provide a space to students um, to help them find their voice and cultivate it. Oftentimes, particularly young folks, uh, might come from experiences where they feel helpless. And so we encourage them to find their strengths and join student organizations. So a lot of students that are part of our organization are part of student demonstrations. They go and uh, fight for the things that are important to them, whether that be human rights uh, in the workplace or human rights um, in, at, the, at the regional level or state level or national level we have opportunities for all of that to happen at CSDI. Um, also, our staff have different uh, interests, and so we're able to connect with students in a different way. Dr. Green is a sociologist, I'm an educator. So whether you're interested in education or sociology, there's a space and a place for you at CSDI. Um, we also uh, function as an identity center. I'll, go, I'll jump to that last bullet point. Um, and this means making sure that we're addressing student needs as they present themselves. And so we want to make sure that all of campus is taking diversity seriously, uh, whether it's personal or interpersonal among each other, institutional, whether it be policies or practices. Um, that is all very important for us to bring to the forefront. Um, so we're the office that does that in conjunction to um, Dr. Tiffany Green, um, which uh, she talked about uh, making some really big changes in the short amount of time that she's been here. If we could have the next slide, please. So um, here's a snapshot of our student services. So these are our uh, in direct work with students. So we're known for our one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, we speak directly uh, with students, whether it be them meeting with myself or with Dr. Green or with our graduate students. And we talked about, and we talked with students about curricular. Um, so this is in the classroom or major related or internship related issues or anything outside of um, the classroom, whether it be social formation, finding friends, finding a job, um, providing opportunities for them to connect or um, excel, whether it be as leaders. Um, this is the type of advising that we provide year round. And right now, even though we are um, not on campus, we're still doing that through our, through text messaging, through uh, Instagram, through Twitter, through Facebook, through email. Our job doesn't stop. And even though sometimes uh, folks have breaks, um, during the summer, we're still at work doing this uh, advising. So parents, uh, feel very confident that you will have CSDI working alongside your students um, year round. Uh, the next student service that we're gonna highlight is the MILT program. And I'll let Dr. Green uh, talk about that. Okay, so MILT stands for uh, Match, Empower, Learn, and Teach. And so this is our, one of our biggest programs coming out of our office. This is a peer mentoring program, as mentioned before. And essentially what the goal is, is to get you connected as soon as possible. Um, research shows that at every school, when first year students get engaged early, they report having a better time at school, they enjoy it, they um, do better in their classes, and they retain all the way through graduation. And so um, this is why finding a mentor or a program similar to this is really important. And so in MELT, what we do is in the summer, we send out an uh, invitation to apply to the MELT program. And essentially that's an email telling you more about MELT, what it is. And then if you're interested in applying, what you do is fill out a demographic sheet, an interest sheet, and uh, kind of think of that like speed dating. So we don't only ask you what is gonna be your major, uh, where are you from, right? We also ask you, what are your interests? Uh, what does your schedule look like? Um, are you gonna be commuting? Do you have any talents, right? We ask you all of those things because we wanna match you with a mentor who will not only be able to relate to you just on the academic side, um, but also someone who you could really relate to, whether it be in 
on some other level, right? Whether it's your identity, um, your gender, your interest, et cetera. Um, students might tell us, I'm really interested in doing study abroad. And we would find a mentor and try our best to match them with a mentor who has done that so that they could help guide them through that process. So our mentors, um, once you're matched, you come to campus, you meet with your mentor, and it's literally the mentor's job is to check on you three times a month. Um, and they do that uh, through text message, um, but they're required to at least one time have an in-person meeting with their mentee. Some mentors have more than one mentee, at most they'll have two, um, but they're still able to manage it fairly well. But what that means is that there's always someone checking out for you, right? There's always going to be someone to say, hey, how are classes going? Do you have any questions? What you'll find when you go um, away to school is that there will be so much information coming at you very quickly and you will look up and it'll be hard to navigate all of this transition. You're moving physically away if you uh, move to campus, um, but even if you don't, you'll still have to figure out how to find classes, how to schedule for classes, uh, where do people hang out, who, how do these instructors, you know, what about this instructor, right? These mentors will tell you all of that stuff. Um, the other good thing about the mentors is that they are student leaders. A lot of them are resident assistants, meaning that they help run the residence halls. Um, they run our student organizations. They might be in student government. They might have gone on study abroad. And so you really kind of get a cheat sheet when you have a, a MELT mentor because you have someone who you can go to to ask those questions or who can tell you what to look out for. Um, so that's why it's really important. And that's why we especially make sure that we provide that for historically underrepresented groups because oftentimes we find those populations don't have people that they can ask those questions to um, on average. Um, the other thing about MELT is that the mentors um, also document what's going on with the student. So if they, I, I also meet with students. So when you first come as a first year student, I'll meet with you, set some goals with you, and it's the mentor's job to check in. And so when we look at that check-in, they don't have to tell us personal um, stories and experiences, but they might say, you know, this person seemed like they were really upset today, or um, I've been trying to reach out to them and I haven't heard back, right? All of those things let us know that they might, there might be something going on with the student and then we're able to check on them. So again, especially for parents, they really appreciate that because they know that there's someone looking out um, for that student. Uh, the last thing I'll say about MEL is that um, we also do social events together. So in the past, the mentors were in charge of putting together some type of social event and inviting everyone. Sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't, so we changed it because we're all about doing what works and not making people do what they don't want to do, right? So we changed that to double dates. And so essentially a mentor and their mentees would meet up with another mentor and their mentee. Our office would provide a small pot of money um, and they would go do things like go get ice cream, uh, maybe get snacks and go watch Netflix. They might um, go to some type of campus event, right? And so we provide funding for the mentors to do that. So uh, Mel is, I advocate for Mel extremely <laughs> because it is really going to make the difference. I was a part of a mentoring program. Um, I went to the University of Cincinnati and I still know my mentor. I still know students who were in that mentoring program and I graduated. I won't tell you when, but a long time ago. Um, and so that shows you how important it is to get engaged early. So um, that's the gist of MELT. The other thing I should mention is that mentors are paid. And so a lot of times after a student is a mentee, they want to apply to be a mentor during their sophomore year and um, beyond. Um, and that also helps, again, with the financial piece. If we could have the next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about our signature programs, um, and I do want to get to the question and answer uh, part of our session. And I want to thank you all for staying with us because I know it's past seven o'clock. And so um, what I will do is have this slideshow uh, sent to you all as a PDF. That way you'll be able to read this. And should you have any questions, you could reach us by uh, email. And I'll include that in the email that Brandon will send. If you could have the next slide, please. So our student voice uh, is something we wanted to highlight. Uh, and so the best place to see what students think about our office is on our social media. Uh, we have an Instagram platform, a Twitter platform, a Facebook pl platform. But these are just some snapshots of what students believe about our programs, how they feel after they 
go to one of the programs. This, these are all collected from Dr. Green. So if you could highlight maybe one Dr. Green. Sure, um, I'll highlight the first picture there to the far left um, from JC Ulasa. That is a annual trip that the Latin American Student Association goes to, which stands for United States Hispanic Leadership Institute. And so what that is, is um, a large conference where um, lots of student organizations like LASA travel to Chicago every year. Um, and there they are able to meet politicians, civil rights activists, they're able to communicate with other um, student groups and just kind of learn more about that history as well as um, having a, res uh, excuse me, a career fair, a grad school fair, right? There's all these types of opportunities that come up. Um, and so what we did here was grab some screenshots of these students' experiences and how valuable those experiences are to them. The other thing our office does is take students to conferences and to these types of experiences. So we also have pictures from um, our Black Feminist Symposium where we took students there last year and this year, as well as um, our campus drag show, which our office helped to um, sponsor. And so, um, yes, yeah, so it's important for you to see that we're not just selling you these things, yeah, that students really do find value. <laughs> in yeah, we're not making it up. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, this is evidence of our programming working. And um, if we could have that last slide, please. For folks, you all could find us uh, at the handle at JCUCSDI. And um, here you see our uh, last year's graduating seniors wearing the blue Kente cloth. And so this is a rites of passage for identity centers is the donning of uh, that cultural garment for graduation. So our job and what I personally believe is um, I don't want you to just start your journey at John Carroll as a first year. I need you to finish and leave John Carroll as a graduate. And so I want you to imagine yourself being in that image with that stole four years from now, next to your parents and families. And so for our graduates, it's very symbolic, especially those who are the first in their families uh, to go to college, to be able to say uh, that they have a John Carroll education and to be the first to be a trailblazer. And for those who come from different communities, that blue stole is also a, signif a signifier of your alliance and your um, ability and skill set uh, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I want you to imagine yourself uh, being up there. And so we're going to leave this slide up. And Brandon, um, I think you have some questions for us that folks have been asking. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I have, uh, I think that we have some chat functions or uh, some questions that were brought up in the chat. I'm trying to like move off my screen share, but let's pull up this chat. Um, well, right now, does anyone, uh, if it, does anyone have any questions for um, our staff right now? It looks like, uh, I thought, I knew there were some messages, but it looks like it's just some thank yous. Uh, for the time and the information. Um, I encourage you, if you have any questions, to try to share those now with us. Um, uh, uh, we have a little bit of time. I know we're a little bit over, but uh, what questions does everyone have for us uh, based off of what you've heard today? I think often I hear folks have questions about our student organizations, and so we went over uh, that. And sometimes we get confused as a student organization. So I want you to, so we're a center and we, have student organizations that are part of our center. And then, um, so we're an office uh, and uh, membership at the student organizations happens at the beginning of the school year. So in September, there'll be a involvement fair where our gym becomes sort of a uh, meet and greet. All of the student organizations will be there with uh, different sign-up sheets and you'll be able to learn about when they meet, uh, how frequently they meet and any opportunities to become a student a leader that's elected. So whether it be something like um, becoming president or vice president or um, a secretary, all of those opportunities will be shared then. Um, so th that's one thing you'll be learning in the fall about involving yourself in student organizations. Yeah, 
And I also see that there was a question asking if there was an email that uh, students can use for questions later. And absolutely, if you have any questions for um, the CSDI staff or uh, I guess for the CSDI staff, we encourage you to use the diversity at jcu.edu email. That would be the best uh, method of contact for them. Or you're always welcome to access the social media platforms that we have on the screen if you'd like to connect that way. Um, if you have uh, your enrollment and admission or financial aid, um, you should uh, already be familiar with your enrollment manager. So if those questions revolve around you know, admissions, financial aid, those kinds of topics, we always encourage you to reach out to uh, your enrollment manager directly because they are the best source of information for those things. But um, everyone here is welcome to talk to you, uh, whatever your questions are. So mm -hmm. any other questions for us for right now? Aaron, can you think of any other questions that we often get asked at um, different uh, visits? Um, let's see. One question that I sometimes get is like, why students come to the office um, other than just social things? And so I think we kind of already touched on that, that it really does help you build um, the skill set. I encourage students, I know some of you are already made your decision, some of you are deciding, but no matter what school you go to, I always encourage you to find a center or an office like ours because it would really be essential, particularly if you're a student um, who's the first in your family to go to college or experiencing some other type of historically underrepresented identity. Um, those, the people in those offices are going to be essential for mm -hmm. Um, you being able to stay for four years and graduate. Again, Absolutely. the folks who helped me out, um, they still check on me. They, they still will write me a recommendation letter if I need it. Um, I can really depend on them. Um, and it's literally our job to support students. So um, that is more than just the social aspect of having a friend, um, that, that support follows you way beyond just your first year. Thank you for sharing that, Erin, because Many of us in the office are products of programs like MELT. Um, for example, I participated in a summer bridge program that uh, connected me with a peer mentor back when I went to um, my first year of college. And uh, I went away for college. So I wanted to, be, I'm from originally from California, from Los Angeles. And I wanted to be far away, but close enough to visit my family. Um, and so that distance uh, made it good for me to create and kind of start anew. And I'll, oftentimes that's what students are looking for. But you need someone to help you with that transition because it could be very lonely, especially if you're the only one in your high school to be going uh, to, let's say, John Carroll or whatever university you decide to go to. Uh, for me, I was the only one in my high school uh, that went to UC San Diego. And so a program like MELT was essential for me to be able to not only have a peer mentor, but also just make friends because other mentees meet each other and that's important. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the people that work at CSDI um, will have an idea of what you may be going through in terms of transitions because we've been through it ourselves. So just like Aaron shared earlier about keeping in touch with folks, um, those ties don't ever go away um, and it's important to nurture them and that's why we we think of us as a community of learners um, and uh, we that's what we welcome a lot of people um, of all backgrounds to our office but we particularly want to pay attention to those who might be uh, feeling like they're the only ones with regard to their social identity or their whatever their situation might be um, a lot of folks have described a CSDI as a home away from home. Um, can you add to any? Um, would you agree, Erin? Yeah, I think we I think we hit that on the head. I, 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 our bonds with students are um, really deep, and they extend even after they graduate. So even as I've been in the office two years, and I've met students who had already graduated before I started because that tie is really deep and important to them and they still come back, they still call, they still check out what's going on and they still support our students. So you're also getting tied into that alumni network too through our office um, and the fact that we have such strong ties with other um, JCU students. Mm -hmm. We also have strong ties with uh, neighboring universities. So um, I echo uh, 
Dr. Green's earlier advice about looking for offices like ours or student organizations, one good um, just skill is to go into the university's homepage and use the search bar and type in those identities that are important for you, whether they be LGBT, whether they be students of color, and see what pops up. If nothing pops up, that's a red flag. But what I'm very proud of is when you type that up in our homepage, you'll get so many hits about programs, opportunities, events, faculty doing research. And I want you to um, leave with that and as an exercise to do uh, either on your own or with your families. And so I believe it's time for us to wrap up. And so I think I'll just leave it to Brandon, but um, yeah. in terms of parting words, I just wanna say thank you to all the families and the students, congratulations on finishing your senior year. And I do need to say that I'm sorry that you won't, for us, our commencement was delayed. And so uh, it's still a huge achievement for you all. So congratulations to you and your families. Yeah. Yeah, kudos to everyone for rolling with the punches in this kind of wild time. Um, but yeah, we want to thank you all again for attending our uh, the, the meeting today. Um, I have just a few last minute reminders. So um, as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us. Give us a phone call. We're still here. Happy to talk to you if you, uh, if you have any questions or want some further information. Um, if you haven't already, um, and you're admitted and you haven't already paid that enrollment deposit and fully committed to John Carroll, we'd still love you to be a blue streak. Um, so if you have questions about your, your enrollment, reach out to your enrollment manager. You can log on to your JCU gateway whenever you get the chance to, uh, to make that final step. Um, I wanna thank um, everyone from the CSDI staff for, for being here tonight. I wanna thank all the students and the, and the families for being here with us as well. Um, but with that, I wish everyone a safe and healthy evening, and we look forward to seeing you on campus this fall. Thanks, everyone. Bye.